everyone and welcome back to my channel. I'm Alexa Allen and each week I talk about a new true crime, conspiracy, or mystery. Last week we talked about the French starlet Claudette Langer and how she was accused of murder. If you would like to check that out, as always, I'll link it right up here. So if you guys are into true crime and mystery like I am, I suggest hitting that subscribe button because like I said, I'm here each week with a new case. If you guys can tell, I got a new camera, so I'm pretty excited about that. This is the first video I'm shooting on it. I'm really distracted because there's a ladybug that keeps flying into my ring light. <laughs> so let's jump right into this week's case. This case is about a missing woman named Kathy Ford. Kathy was born July 20th, 1968. And at the time of her disappearance, she was 19 years old. She was 5'9", 140 pounds, and she had brown hair and brown eyes. Kathy was born in a small town called Gorman, Maryland. It was a really small town and only had about a couple hundred people. Her parents owned a little restaurant there called the Old Mill Restaurant, and Kathy worked there as a waitress. Kathy was said to be an average teenage girl. She had a steady boyfriend, didn't get into a lot of trouble, worked at her parents' diner, and just was a regular small town girl. She was romantically involved with a man named Paul Farrell, and their relationship allegedly started in 1987, the fall before her disappearance. At the time, Paul lived in this little town called Gormenia, which was right across the river in West Virginia. Paul's parents were also small town business owners. They owned a little general store, and Paul helped with the family business just like Kathy did, and they were said to kind of relate on this experience that they both sort of felt kind of tied to their small town and maybe almost stuck there because they felt like they had to help their parents. In January 1988, Paul became the deputy sheriff of Grant County, West Virginia. Now, Paul was also in a relationship with a woman named Kathy Bernard. Her name was Kathy as well. And she didn't know about the affair, of course, and neither did Kathy Ford's boyfriend. So the day of Kathy's disappearance, February 17th, 1988, Kathy is working at her family's restaurant and a phone call comes in. It's someone claiming to be a local magistrate giving a warning that they're going to be going around and kind of cracking down on serving alcohol to minors and checking IDs. Shortly after, around two o'clock, a second call came in that was basically along the same lines. It was a sheriff saying the same things and Kathy took this call as well. He was kind of acting like he was tipping Kathy off, giving her a favor, saying there was gonna be spot checks around local restaurants. So he asked if they could meet up somewhere privately and discuss the details because he couldn't tell her everything over the phone. Kathy told her coworkers about the call, but she would not say who this person was because she said they could lose their job for telling me. Kathy then left the restaurant and she told her coworkers, just please make sure you're IDing everyone. Be very strict about it. Then she did come back about an hour later. She had her hair and makeup done. She was all dressed up. She grabbed her purse and she asked her coworker how she looked and she left in her dad's silver Bronco and that was the last time anyone ever saw Kathy Ford. So later that night around 8.30, Paul joins his friends at the local bowling alley. And when he gets there, the man working behind the counter says, someone's been calling and asking for you. And when Paul called the number back, Kathy answered the phone. Kathy was very upset and she wanted to meet with Paul and she wanted to meet him at his trailer, but Paul didn't like that idea because of the affair and he didn't really want to meet at his, you know, his house. And he said, I think it's a better idea if we meet at the high school parking lot. So she said, okay, I'll meet you there. He hangs up, goes to meet Kathy at the parking lot. He said he waited there about 20 minutes and she never showed up, so he left. And at that time, Kathy's parents had already reported her missing, but Paul had no idea. The next day, Kathy's friends and family put out this huge search. They went looking all around town for Kathy and nothing came up. And at one point during that day, Paul runs into Darvin, who is Kathy Ford's boyfriend. Now, Darvin is very confrontational with Paul. And he says, you know, Kathy was last seen driving down your road and I saw smoke by your trailer. What's going on? And Paul was very confused about this and kind of alarmed and he felt like he was being accused of something. So Paul pretty quickly runs back to his trailer and he starts looking around the woods to see if there's any evidence of there being a fire last night. Paul then finds Kathy's vehicle burnt about 200 yards from his house. 
According to Paul, he saw the vehicle and was so terrified that Kathy was in there and that she was dead, he wouldn't even go near it. He then made a decision which he later called a stupid mistake. He sent an anonymous letter to the Old Mill restaurant, which is Kathy's parents' restaurant, and the letter claimed that Kathy had run away and that she was safe, not to worry, and it included $200 to cover the damages of the Bronco. And initially, Paul denied writing this letter, but FBI investigated the handwriting and they discovered that it was in fact his and he later confessed to writing it. He said he did it because he didn't want people to find the car in his backyard and arrest him, which he knows they would have done. Kind of jumping back, we haven't discovered that Paul wrote these letters yet. March 8th, about three weeks after Kathy has disappeared, her vehicle is discovered by Darwin and Kathy's brother, in Paul's yard. These two had been suspicious of Paul ever since Kathy disappeared. So they took it upon themselves to go look in his yard. So March 11th, the FBI comes in and they search the area. They find no evidence of Kathy's body or any DNA to prove that she was ever there and any fingerprints that could have been detected on the car were burnt in the fire. They also noted that none of the area around the car had been burnt, none of the ground had been burnt, so they thought that the car was probably burned somewhere else and brought to Paul's property. On March 19th, FBI agents tear up Paul's newly laid carpet, and they do find traces of blood evidence on the floor, walls and ceiling. But the samples of the DNA proved to be inconclusive. The only thing that they could determine was that the blood was not inconsistent of the blood of Kathy's parents. So based on that evidence so far, the FBI concluded that Kathy was dead and that she had been killed in a violent act. Paul Farrell was arrested and charged with kidnapping, arson, and murder. So the investigators start to build a case around Paul and they find out some pretty weird stuff. Paul had this little weird hobby where he liked to call up local libraries and bookstores and speak to fee female employees pretending that he was a doctor. He would have them get this certain book and read paragraphs from them containing adult content. This is one of their major pieces of evidence and they used it to connect the fact that he liked to make these weird phone calls and the fact that he could have been the person that made that phone call to Kathy that day. Paul's trial starts January 25th, 1989. The prosecutors gather all these women that are witnesses against Paul. They too had received phone calls from an anonymous man asking to meet him in certain areas around town. These calls were all apparently made a few weeks leading up to Kathy's disappearance. He would direct these women to meet him in certain places and they were all pretty close to where Paul's trailer was. And in these calls, this person would always be disguised as a doctor police officer or magistrate. And all of these women who received the calls had one thing in common. They all knew Paul. A woman named Tamela Kitzmiller testified that she believed the caller was Paul, but she later said she wasn't sure. She said that the investigators told her that it was Paul and that they could prove it, and that he was also a suspect in the Yellowstone murders. And this woman had worked in Yellowstone National Park, so she was more inclined to think that it was Paul due to what she was being told. The prosecution in turn denied this and said they would never lead a witness like that. Paul did admit to making some of these calls, but he said this had nothing to do with Kathy or her disappearance. As the trial progressed, the prosecution did something that was a little unorthodox. An FBI agent said that when he was interrogating Paul, he gave him a hypothetical situation about Kathy and her murder, and he said Paul's body language leaned toward the side of guilty. And some of the strongest evidence against Paul came from his neighbor, Kim Nelson. Now, Kim could see Paul's trailer from her house. Kim told prosecutors that she heard screams coming from Paul's trailer on multiple occasions. In court, she testified that on February 17th, she heard banging, a gunshot, and a woman screaming coming from his trailer. But just like Tamela, she later said that words were put in her mouth and that screaming and gunshots were common in that area. She would also say that before the trial, she signed a paper that she didn't read. And the paper had said 
that the screaming was specifically heard on February 17th, which she did not say initially. Again, the prosecutor denied forcing the witness, and he thought that Paul's family later got to her to try to recant her statement. Other witnesses placed Paul at a phone booth the day of Kathy's disappearance. They said he was calling a woman, he was pretending to be a magistrate, and he said to meet him at the fire hall. A postal worker testified that she had received a call in the weeks leading up to Kathy's disappearance. They called saying, you have a stranded postal worker at this location, someone needs to come and get him. But the postal worker was like, no, we don't have anyone that even delivers to that road. And she hung up and just thought it was very strange. It also came out that the day after Kathy went missing, Paul ripped out the carpet from his trailer and burned it. This was the carpet in his bedroom and he told his girlfriend and his landlord that the carpet had foul odor and stains on it. But his girlfriend and landlord both said they didn't notice either one of those things on the carpet. Kathy Bernard, Paul's girlfriend, also said that she found a note in Paul's pocket talking about setting someone up with a fake ID. She asked Paul about it and he said, oh yeah, someone's going around to restaurants seeing if people are selling alcohol to minors. One of the people that were volunteering and helping with Kathy's search, they said that Paul came up to them one day and said, it's time to call off the search. This was about a week after Kathy's disappearance. He said it's time to call off the search for about 48 hours because the police have found something. But this wasn't true. At one point during the search for Kathy, Paul calls his girlfriend, Kathy Bernard, from Uniontown, Pennsylvania. I don't know why he was there. And he tells her to let Kathy Ford's parents know that Kathy is all right. So with all of this evidence stacked up against Paul, he was convicted on February 4th, 1989. He was convicted of kidnapping, murder, and arson, and sentenced to a minimum of 15 years in prison. Now this was a huge deal in the media because there was no physical evidence or even proof that Kathy was actually dead. The town was very divided. So at one point, a journalist, Martin Yant, he starts looking into the case and he discovers that there was a couple that thinks they saw Kathy. It was December 1989, about a year after Kathy went missing, and this couple from Gorman was traveling down to Tennessee. They visited this little restaurant and they noticed that a waitress really looked like Kathy and that she looked like she recognized the couple and got really nervous when she saw them. And then another waitress came over to this couple and she asked them, you guys don't look like you're from around here, where are you from? Which they thought was very strange. And when they told this waitress where they were from, that waitress was said to go back over to the woman that looked like Kathy and told her something and then Kathy ran to the back of the restaurant. This was looked into, but it was later proven that that woman was not Kathy. Paul, of course, appealed his conviction. He said there was insufficient evidence of Kathy's death and that the evidence used against him about the, the guilty body language should have never been used in court. He also argued that the jury was not properly instructed on how much blood there was in his trailer. The prosecution kind of made it seem like there was a lot of blood, but there was really just little splashes of it, I guess. But the West Virginia Supreme Court did reject Paul's appeal. In 2001, the governor of Maryland, Cecile Underwood, reviewed Paul's case. Paul had his case commuted and was released in 2004 on parole. The governor's office stated, Paul's convictions are not supported by the presence of the alleged victim's body, weapon, eyewitnesses, or physical evidence such as fingerprints, hair, and fibers. They went on to label the trial and conviction as a miscarriage of justice. The prosecution and others involved in the trial we're very upset about this. They went on to claim that this governor's decision was a miscarriage of justice and that he clearly had not done his research on Paul's case. Now, Kathy's family does believe that Kathy is dead, unfortunately, and they don't think she would have run away without ever calling them. That just wasn't like her. She was very close to her family because some people do think she ran away. Those that believe that Kathy is dead think that she most likely will never be found. There are so many coal mines in that area, they guess that her body is probably dumped into one of those and will never be found. This is another one of those tough ones. You know, I do think Paul is probably guilty. However, was there enough evidence to convict him beyond a reasonable doubt? 
Mm, I don't really think so. But as always, please let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and let me know if there's any cases you want me to cover in the future. Thank you guys so much for stopping by and I'll see you next time.